Last week we covered his rarest guitars, today we cover his weirdest ones. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogley's Guitar Show. That's right, we're talking about the Les Paul Estate auction again. This sale occurred in mid-2012. Let's get into it. Typically, when you think of Les Paul, you think Gibson, but did you know he had at least one historic Fender Telecaster within his collection? Now, to be more specific, this is the no-caster version. It's from the year 1951. There we can see the date stamp confirming its manufacturer, and it's actually signed on the backside of the headstock. And it still has the thermometer case with it. So maybe there's an additional story in Les Paul's autobiography, but they do say it's uncharacteristically light at seven and a half pounds. For me, I just think it's cool that we have a picture of Les holding a Fender guitar. Whether he used it a lot or not, I mean, judging by the condition, probably not, but it's part of history. No casters are cool. And this one absolutely blew away the estimates. But next, you might have heard that Les Paul hated the SGs so much he wanted his name taken off of them. While that is a common rumor that floats around, as far as I'm aware, the true reason is his contract expired, and they decided not to renew it until the Les Paul started to gain popularity again, and they get rebirthed in 1968. You can learn that story in this 68 reissue episode. So I thought it was funny that there were a couple of SGs within his collection. This is the only one we're going to talk about today because I love these things. I think you could tell there's some age on it just based on the way that it's made. It doesn't look exactly like the SGs of today for a few different reasons. We've got the small block inlay, so that puts us within the 70s, 80s era. But how can you tell this one is officially 80s? Look at our control layout here. Their output jack's actually on the side. I like it being a Les Paul guy, so maybe Les Paul liked it for that reason too. They're unique little guys. This one sold for five and a half thousand. Next up, an unknown Fender copy almost breaks 10 grand. And it's for this weird doofy thing. We've got this interesting star show style headstock, metal plate over your truss rod, dual string trees, really old strings in general, you've got your zero fret, you've got a hundred million different switches over here, looks like impossibly high action with flat wound strings. But would you look at this thing? What is that? It's got some sort of a clip on device on the back? That's a microphone. And here we have an awesome photo of Les holding this guitar. You can tell by the way he's smiling. This might not have been the most expensive or rarest guitar in his collection, but he has a passion for it. There's a story and he just loves how quirky it is. Les was known for using a microphone in his guitars there, so he definitely had to do that modification himself. And while he did sign a lot of his guitars, this is one of the more oddball ones that he would sign. And had we not had this photo, I don't think it would have sold for anywhere near that much. But next up, we have a guitar with a message from Les Paul that's sold for nearly 3000 So this is an old bell tone. Doesn't look like the highest quality of guitar, definitely hasn't seen a lot of use and needs some TLC, but the reason why you want this one comes down to our message. It reads, to my friend Al Dimiola, if you can't tune this, call me, Les. You just know that was a joke that got those two laughing. However, I'm not quite sure why Al doesn't have it anymore. Along similar lines, there's a balalaika from Russia with love, and it says Les Paul. That doesn't look like a Les Paul signature to me. That looks like somebody else wrote it on there. So it's probably a gift to him from someone. And here's our answer, a Russian rock band. That's very cool that Les kept that. But whoa, I've never seen the back of one of those things. I'm too used to the Gorky Park signature. That's definitely got some depth to it. Next, we have Unknown Origin Acoustic Guitar. Something about this one's just kind of creepy to me. It looks like you've got some pieces of pizza and then you've got Les Paul upside down on the guitar. Like if you were to actually install a bridge, it would be like covering his mouth. <laughs> Doesn't look like a particularly good guitar, but I didn't stop it for selling for 800 bucks. Now this one you're seeing double, double Les Pauls, double acoustic guitars all on a guitar. It's still a little bit weird, but I find the design more appealing than our last, so it brought twice as much. But get this, did you know Les Paul had Chipsons in his collection? This is one of the stranger ones that was advertised as a Gibson Les Paul standard. In my opinion, I don't think this was actually made by Gibson. We have a really off-center top, which would not necessarily be too uncommon if it was a three-piece top. But it's not, it's only two. It looks like it's made out of a body wood that you don't normally see. And the cream plastics don't quite look right. But then we go to the headstock and you've got three screw truss rod cover. I suppose this could have started life as like a Sonics neck and they converted it over into a standard truss rod. Because the logo looks okay, we do have headstock wings showing. 
this makes me go, no. Gibson scarf joints. There are a very few models in its history, like the Marauder and S1, that do have a scarf joint, you know, traditional style. But I've never seen a Gibson have this style scarf joint. We're also lacking a serial number in these tuners. And then look at that heel with another scarf joint. No, that routing doesn't look right at all. There's certainly a story to this one, but Gibson did not make that in my opinion. Unless this is a prototype for an import brand that they decided, nah, we're, we're not going to devalue our stuff with that. Because that's what they listed it as, a prototype model. I would definitely want more of a story on that one personally, but it sold for six and a half thousand. But if you want one that is 100% without a doubt a Gibson, here it is in the title, Imported Les Paul Custom Copy. Why would Les want this? Probably wanted to check out the competition to see what they would do. Now why he would keep it long term, maybe it's because he actually liked it. Or just wanted a reminder about how bad these things are. <laughs> I like the headstock on this one. It's ESP-esque, but yet still within Gibson's vein. Like, there you go. It's got the exact same Gibson logo that we saw on that last one. That actually does look legit. I think somebody has modified this one further. It'd be funny if he took these around to trade shows to see if people could tell the difference. Or if it was like a learning piece because yeah the, the volute style a little bit wonky and apparently the chipboard case has a hole in it to accommodate the toggle switch <laughs> isn't that just nice how cool would that be to own les paul's personal imported custom copy but how about this next one it's listed as an 80s gibson les paul prototype which we've got this really lame cutaway design you've got a single volume control one humbucker you've got your kbx trem system your headstock has absolutely no branding on it at all you've got unique inlays because they're very rounded off on the corners then the back side of the headstock there we see that scarf joint we were talking about that gibson never uses the description says it's Korean made, but I think this would have been more accurately described as an Epiphone prototype because this is an Epiphone guitar and we're going to see a whole bunch of them later on. But apparently this one may have been a prototype selling for 4000 This is by far one of the craziest guitars, even crazier than that Nocaster. We've got a 2003 PV Van Halen Wolfgang Les Paul model. This is only funny because we normally associate his name with the Les Paul shape. So seeing that blatantly advertised on something that's not a Les Paul is just really funny. That inlay work looks good. It appears to be real mother of pearl with an awesome bird's eye maple neck. But it's also attached to Eddie Van Halen in a roundabout way. This was a personal gift from the man himself to the other man himself. On top of that, the guitar's color is just awesome. I love the zebra pickups, the red burst, the quilt top. And then we've got our customization on it, reading nothing but love. Without you, none of us would be. And this was gifted for his 88th birthday. Even as a primarily Gibson guy, that's pretty cool. Sadly, both of these greats are no longer with us. So I think if this came to market today, the price would probably be a little bit different. Speaking of those weird Epiphones, let's start to get into them. So this is what they ended up looking like. They've got kind of a modified Gibson headstock style. They've got a really Neil Sean signature-esque inlay on the headstock. I wonder if that's where he took that from. But I love the stylizing of the Epiphone logo on this, especially being in Mother of Pearl. Having the Les Paul doesn't hurt, but they were scarf joints. And this one is an HSS setup, and it utilized the selector switches to turn each of them on and off so you can get all the different possible combinations, kind of like the US1 and U2 series we talked about recently. Agufish actually uh, reviewed one of these a long time ago, and we did a small collaboration about the history of them, so you can check that episode out if you'd like. But Les actually had lots of Epiphones in his collection. This one is a little bit strange, though. So in the late 80s, Epiphones kind of had the Gibson-esque headstock. And we have not seen this return in a really, really long time. But people have been asking and asking for it. But I think I've said enough. But look at this. It's just so interesting to have the Mother of Pearl Epi logo and a kind of similar headstock style. But this is like at the very birth of Epiphone being what we think of it today. Cheaper imported guitars rather than the fancy vintage offerings. So yeah, we've got like this really doofy giant horn there. It's just ridiculous. The burst, I think it only looks bad because the body shape is way off. Well, here we can see our scarf joint in a different location. And I would imagine Les just kept this, you know, for the history and maybe to laugh at it once in a while. But it got the final laugh when it sold for three grand. But eventually Epiphone became the clipped wing headstock as we knew it for such a long time. It only recently changed again. But here's kind of a cool sparkle gold top with a Bigsby B5 on it. It's pretty cool, but I didn't think it would be worth that much. Speaking of the fancy vintage ones, look at this one. Love that old world style logoing. And our awesome fanned out inlays. 
It's got a multi-pieced flamed maple neck. This is known as the Zephyr Deluxe. This one has a big giant hole cut out of the back of it, so I would assume the electronics are non-original. I mean, looking over here on Reverb at a different one, it doesn't have a hole, but it also has the Epiphone mini humbuckers. But here is one of the single pickup versions of the weird Epiphone. Here's a 1991 custom. Our body shape is still pretty wonky, but we've got the really sweet headstock. Here's kind of an older Les Paul Deluxe from the Epiphone lineup. Man, I just love those truss rod covers. They're stylized so cool with the font. Here's one from 2007, the Les Paul Ultra 2. It's got a pretty nice quilt veneer top. Here's a 2006 custom, upside down neck pickup and all. A 98 model. One from 2005 with the Black Beauty treatment, a white 1990. 2005 Sunburst. This one sold for a lot. I wonder if there's a story. Not one that was advertised anyway, but it was definitely a gift for less. Here's another Ultra. Here's a 56 reissue. A 99 standard. And wow, this thing sold for 6,000. It's another white custom from 06. And ah, uh, dark history. The last guitar he played in the hospital. I suppose that would make sense. But if you like Bigsby's, here's another one with one of them. Another one of the HSS setup weird ones. But hey, here we go, the first double humbucker variation on this one. I would say this looks better in the white finish, especially with the regular control layout. If only the KBX wasn't the worst trem system, these things would be pretty cool. But man, Les really liked the original Epiphones. He kept a lot of those back. But how about this for a cool Epi? This kind of looks like the Joe Perry signature, and I think it's the Epiphone version of that, but I could be wrong. But this Epiphone brought $3,000, and I think it's because... Les had a, a little bit too much fun with it. <laughs> what do we got going on here? Is that a meat headstock? Oh, okay. That's supposed to be a pair of lips. I'll never look at the old Epiphone headstock style the same again. Let's go, model. Boogie. That's interesting. So we've got some sort of a stovetop thing on here. No, I'm just kidding. It's more likely a speaker of some sort. We've got a preamp, gain, master, reverb, chorus, tone controls, turning the speaker on and off. This is definitely a very less thing. I mean, look at that. The routing was actually pretty decent. And cool, it's got a comfort cut. I think the reason why this didn't sell for so crazily much is that doesn't look like Les's handiwork. I think somebody gave that to him. But that certainly fits our theme of crazy guitars. But our fun's not over yet. Besides Epiphones in his collection, did you know there's something called the Orville brand? As far as I understand it, they're made over in Japan. There's two different brandings to them. There's Orville, then there's Orville by Gibson. Typically, the by Gibson ones sell for more because they actually had like the Gibson electronics. But they were still made in Japan. People always seem to like these things. If you were the show sent me an old 1989 one that we reviewed in this episode about three years ago, if you want to check it out more in depth. But then there's also a Brownsville Choir Boy. I've got to say, I, I can see why he would have kept this thing. Three strange pickups. Oh, that's a really innovative design. It's kind of like a Stratocaster tremolo system, but without the trem portion, because it looks like it comes through the back. Yes, indeed it does. And it's a bolt-on neck and made in Korea. Someone named Chris gave it to him for his 86th birthday. So more of a sentimental piece. But I was shocked to see something like this in his collection. An Electra model. So we've documented a few of these. They're a lot of fun. Especially the NPCs. So this is one of the Electra versions that's not like a one-for-one -one Les Paul copy, as far as the headstock goes, but they made them earlier on. Ooh, somebody upgraded our tuners to real waffle backs, at least on two of them. But okay, this was one of the MPC versions. Basically, it has little Nintendo cartridges that you can plug in to make it different effects. But then he also had a three-quarter size guild, appears to have been modified. They actually have an old photo of him using this one, pre-modifications. Or maybe it's not even the same guitar, kind of hard to tell. But he said it sounds great! This one has the same inscription saying if you can't tune it, call me, but it was going to be given to somebody else. I always like how Les has secret codes within the way he signs things. Like if he knew you were a guitar player, he would sign it, keep picking. If he knew that you weren't, he would use a different signature. He just had something for all walks of life. And even Les could not escape the wonderful world of baritone guitar. This thing sold for eight grand. And it just looks like a little brown peanut. But it looks like the back is gold. That's awesome. He liked it enough to put a signature on it. But to end out our episode of Weird Guitars, I just wanted to throw some weird items in general. You could have bought Les Paul's signed passport. It's $4,000. There's collectors for everything. But that's pretty rare to get his full name signature of his real name. It's funny, they legally marked it, also known as Les Paul. 
This next item sold for $11,000, and it's not even a guitar. It's a slash hat, gifted to Les Paul by Slash. A gifted slash hat, two very influential guys, that's really cool. Les and Slash must have got along famously, because there was also this Les Paul standard in his collection that was personalized to him. I'm not sure if it's from the same event, or maybe Les jokingly said, hey, I need a hat like yours, one day at a shared concert. But I like Slash's words here, especially how he signs it from the guy in the hat. You know they had some playful banter. Next up, you could buy Les Paul's credit cards and membership pieces. A little bit weird. I'm sure they were all canceled. It's not just free money and you can't join all these cool clubs. But how about this one? Three and a half thousand for just a drawing that Les apparently did on the back side of a scrap sheet of paper. Knowing that this is how Les draws Les Paul's freehand, I don't feel so bad anymore. I know the shape in my mind, but to draw it is just a completely different story. And then check out the Les Paul living room lamp. It's really cool. I don't know if it's $9,000 cool, but that is pretty sweet. That's not just his living room lamp. That was part of something bigger than itself. I understand now. We also lived in a world where a napkin from his 72nd birthday could fetch 400 bucks. I don't believe it's like hand drawn. It's just he had this artist design it and then they printed it on a whole bunch of them. And then lastly, for strange items, you could have bought Les Paul's social security card. I don't know. I just feel that strange. Like I'm going to have my editor blur out his social security number, even though you can go to Julian's and look it up. And you'd have to be a really ballsy criminal to steal Les Paul's identity after he has passed. But that just seems really strange to me. And on that note, we will say goodbye for this episode. And we'll see you next time within the Les Paul collection of his favorite pieces. Take care. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day. And you might even enjoy this next one.